up for Chesterfield. Chesterfield, first cigarette in America to give you premium quality in both regular and king size, brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a juvenile division. You get a call from a high school principal. A young boy has caused a near riot in his classroom. Your job? Investigate. Here's what the nation's press has had to say about king-size Chesterfields. U.S. Tobacco Journal says, Boston dealers and jobbers reported this new companion of the regular size is sweeping the market in sales, and stocks cannot be replaced fast enough. The Wall Street Journal said, a wholesaler says the problem isn't selling them. It's getting enough to meet the demand. Dealers all over the country tell us no product they ever handled has grown so fast in so short a time as king-size Chesterfields. King-size cigarettes give you quantity, but only Chesterfield king-size gives you quantity plus quality, premium quality. Chesterfield king-size contains tobaccos of better quality and higher price than any other king-size cigarette. Of course, it's the same fine tobacco as in regular Chesterfield. In fact, the only difference between Chesterfield king-size and Chesterfield regular is that the king-size is larger, contains more of these same tobaccos, enough to give you a 21% longer smoke, yet costs very little more. So remember, Chesterfield is the first to give you premium quality in both regular and king-size. Buy them either way you like them. Chesterfield gives you the best possible smoke. Much milder Chesterfield. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment... Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, October 3rd. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of juvenile division. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Stein. My name's Friday. It was 1.47 p.m. when we got to Adams High School. Chemistry class. Are you the police? Yes, sir. It's my partner, Frank Smith. My name's Friday. I'm John Lane. This is my class. What little there is left of it. Have you seen Mr. Barlow? Yes, sir. We talked to him when we came in. I think he's in the clinic now. He said you could give us the stories, all right? It was the Lambert boy. He came into class about five minutes late. Uh-huh. We were just starting the lecture on analysis. I told Douglas to take his seat. He said something I couldn't hear, but he went back to his place, and I went on with the lecture. Mm-hmm. I guess it was about ten minutes later that the commotion started. The first thing I knew about it, Larry McLean started to yell at Lambert, said something about keeping his mouth closed. Mm-hmm. Then Lambert said something about McLean minding his own business. I started off the platform to quiet things down. By the time I got to Douglas, he'd hit McLean. Well, after that, it's all a little confused. Flying apparatus, chemicals being thrown all over the place, glass breaking. The whole class seemed to explode. Well, were the other members of the class fighting, or was it just the two boys? It seemed like the whole class was fighting. At the time, it seemed like the whole school was in the room, all throwing things. Mm-hmm. And finally, I got the Lambert boy aside, and then the fight seemed to stop. In the meantime, he'd thrown a bottle of sulfuric acid at McLean, burned his face and his chest... The ambulance took him to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital, and a nurse here gave him first aid. Well, do you have any idea what started the argument here? No, I'm not sure. As I got it later, it seems that Douglas made some remark about a young girl working next to him. I didn't hear it, but I gathered that it was a pretty filthy statement. McLean heard it, and that's when he told Douglas to keep his mouth closed. Mm-hmm. Lambert is known as a sort of troublemaker, then, is he? Yes, and it's so hard to understand. Sir? Sure. Well, up until just lately, I'd say the last two months or so, he was a model student. He had a straight-A average. I wonder if we could see the boy. I guess so. There isn't anything much I can do here. Oh, terrible. It'll be a couple of weeks before I can hold a class in here again. It's terrible. Yes, sir. The clinic's down here. Have you any idea what might have caused this change in the Lambert boy? Well, I have my own suspicions, but he's only 15. It's hard to believe. What's that, sir? When he came into class today, I think he was drunk. Oh, why do you say that? 
I noticed that when he came into the room, he wasn't very steady on his feet. It had to be something like that to make him do this. Then, too, when I grabbed him when they were fighting, mm-hmm. I thought I smelled liquor on his... Oh, we go in here. All right. Here's the boy. Douglas? Yes, sir. These men would like to talk to you. Yes, sir. They're from the police. Mr. Friday and this is Mr. Smith. Hello? There you go. Sit down, son. Yes, sir. How's Larry? I don't know. They took him to the hospital. If you don't mind, Mr. Friday, I'll check with the nurse, see how badly Larry was hurt. Yes, sir. Go right ahead. Now, son, you want to tell us what this is all about? There's not much to tell. Larry and me got in a fight. Mm -hmm. Well, what started the fight, son? I don't know. He just wanted to cause trouble. Him and me never have gotten along. Always had trouble. You been drinking, Doug? Why do you ask that? Because I want to know. Have you been drinking? How about it, boy? No. Where would I get something to drink? Well, now, something's a little wrong here, son, according to what Mr. Lane tells us. Looks like you might have been drunk when the fight started. He tells us that you said something to a young girl in the class. That's what started the whole thing. You know he's lying? Is he? Sure. He's on Larry's side. The two of them are real thick. That's not what he told us, Doug. From what he said, he's pretty fond of you. Said he couldn't figure out what happened to you lately. Well, he's okay, but why does he say I was loaded? That's a stupid thing to say. Yeah, especially if you weren't. I'll tell you what, Doug. Hmm? Let's get a traffic investigation car over here and take a toxometer test, huh, just to be sure. Why? What'll that prove? That'll straighten it out once and for all, whether you're drunk or not. How about it, boy? Shall I call the car? Doug? No, you don't have to do that. I had a couple of drinks. Nothing serious, though. Just a couple of drinks. Nothing wrong with that, is there? Where'd you get the liquor, son? I don't remember. No, this won't work, boy. We'll find out. You know that. Well, I don't see what difference it's going to make where I got it. I've been drinking a couple of years. I know how to handle it. I know what I'm doing. Mr. Friday? Yes, sir? You see you, man. Well, sure. What's going on? Something wrong with Larry? I don't know, son. I thought he was okay when they took him to the hospital. Mm-hmm. The nurse said she took care of it. They said he was going to be okay. All right, boy. Let's go. Where are you taking me? We want to talk to you downtown. Something has gone wrong, hasn't it? Something's wrong with Larry. He's dead. No, son. Larry's all right. He's burned, but he's going to be all right. You're lying. I know. You want to take me to jail. No, that's not true, son. We just want to find out where you got the liquor. Yeah. Well, I haven't done anything. A couple of drinks, that's all. What's the harm in that? Come on, son. You've got a lot to explain. Okay, take me in. Put me in jail. I don't care what happens. Yeah, you've already proved that. 2.26 p.m. Frank and I talked to Charles Barlow, the vice principal of the school. He told us the same story that we'd gotten from John Lane. He said that until a few months before, Douglas Lambert had been a model student. He was above average in his classwork and took part in all school activities. Suddenly, and without apparent reason, he had become the number one troublemaker in his class. His attendance record became one of the worst, and his attitude toward his teachers was arrogant and discourteous. The principal told us the same attitude was being displayed by other students in the school. We notified Mrs. Lambert that we were taking him to Georgia Street Juvenile for questioning. We filled in Captain Stein on the developments, and then Frank and I questioned the Lambert boy. He was sullen and uncooperative. I don't know what you want with me. A little fight, that's all it was. Why are you guys trying to make something big out of it? You've already done that, Doug. Maybe you don't know what you've really done. Maybe we ought to fill you in on a few things. That might not be such a bad idea. Tell me how I'm a criminal. Tell me I was a bad boy. Go ahead, tell me. Don't get smart, son. What do you want me to do? Sit here and listen to you guys yak at me? You expect me just to sit here and let you guys tie a rap on me that I haven't got coming? You got one thing on me. I had a couple of drinks, that's all. A couple of drinks. No harm in that. I don't feel so good. Why don't you guys leave me alone? I got a headache. Larry McLean's got more than a headache. So the kid shouldn't have started anything he couldn't finish. He wanted to be a big man in front of the class. He was. Now he's hurt and he's trying to blame me. It won't work, cop, and you know it. That's enough of that. I'm a minor. You can't touch me. That's the trouble with you, kid. You think because you're under 18, the laws don't mean you. You can't touch me and you know it. Don't worry, Doug. Nobody's going to touch you, but let me tell you a couple of things. You sit here and figure you're a big man, a real tough kid. You don't have to tell me. Well, I'm going to tell you. I'm getting sick and tired of having kids like you waltz around the streets, your minds and hands filthy, bragging about what big men you are. You do what you want. You don't care about what it means to the people around you. How you hurt them doesn't matter. Everything's fine until you do something wrong and we nail you. Right away you start screaming minor that you're a juvenile, just a kid acting normal. You steal a car for a joyride. An officer starts after you. You don't care who gets in front of the car as long as you get away. You don't let anybody stand in your way. Men, women, kids, they're all the same to you. Run them down. Show them that you're just a healthy kid out for some fun. After all, you're just a kid. The laws weren't meant for you. You're different. Well, there's another kid lying in a hospital right now. He's got real trouble. He got in your way. He didn't feel that you had any special rights. Be a big man, Doug. You go tell him that you knew what you were doing when you threw that acid at him. You tell him that you were just having a little carefree fun. Tell him that you know how to handle liquor. 
Tell him that he's going to spend a long time with a plastic surgeon because you're just a kid. You tell him that his face is going to be like that because you're just a normal, healthy, growing boy. I hope you're real proud of yourself. I hope you feel good. You've burned it right into your brain. There isn't any place you can go to get away from it. All right, boy, let's go. Wait a minute, Mr. Friday. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I acted like that. All right, you want to try to make things right with Larry? You want to help us out on this thing? Yeah, I guess so. Where do I start? Where'd you get the liquor? A place near school. Kids call it Sam's Club. What's the address? I don't know. I'll show you the place. You say it's a club? Well, sort of. You have to know the ropes before you can get in the place. What do you mean, the ropes? Well, they only let kids in. You ring the bell to the house, and then when they answer, you stand there with a $5 bill in your hand. Mm -hmm. That way they know you're okay. Who is this Sam? I don't know his last name. The kids just call him Sam. He run this place all by himself? No, there's his wife, Inez. She's usually around. Just these two around the place, then, huh? Yeah, that's all I know about. It always seemed to me that Inez was really the brain. She was always telling Sam what to do. Hmm. How'd you find out about this place, Doug? One of the kids at school told me about it. He took me there one night. Then after he introduced me to Sam and Inez, I started to go there by myself. What's it like inside? they have a bar or anything like that? Oh, yeah. You walk into the living room, and there's a big bar along the right wall. All chrome and leopard skin. Real nice. There's a few tables around and a record player. Mm. They sell anything else in this place besides liquor? I don't think I know what you mean. You know what we mean, Doug. Yeah, I guess I do. Well, how about it? Well, yeah, you can buy tea if you want it. Mm -hmm. This $5 routine, what happens to it? Well, drinks are six bits apiece. Sticks are a buck and a half. If you want to give them the five as you come in, you can have as much as you want. Otherwise, you pay for each thing as you get it. You ever smoke marijuana? Well, almost all the kids there do. How about you? If you don't, the other kids call you a coward. Well, you still haven't answered the question. Yeah, I've smoked it a couple of times. Can you give us the names of the other youngsters who go to this place? Well, wait a minute. I'll help all I can, but I'm not going to be a squealer. I don't think it's squealing, Doug. Yeah, well, you don't have to give the names. Why not look at it this way, boy? You got trouble because of this Sam and Inez. Now, the same thing could happen to one of the other kids that go to this place. You want that to happen? No, but... Well, the best way to see that it doesn't is to tell us all you know about the place. Isn't that right? I guess so. I'll give you the names. Do they allow girls in this place, too? Yeah, as long as you know the $5 bill gimmick, anybody can get in. They allow adults? No, if they figure you're over 18, they won't let you in. Especially at the Saturday night parties. What kind of those? Every Saturday night, Sam and Inez throw a party. For five bucks, you get all you want to drink and smoke. Sam told me once it's a good business. Makes for better customer relations. Mm -hmm. You ever see any other narcotics on the premises? I've never actually seen any myself. I've heard that if Sam or Inez know you real well, you can get a pop of heroin. But like I said, I've never seen it myself. Most of the kids that I know, the ones from school, just go there for drinks. Anything else you think we ought to know? No, nothing that I can think of. How about these two? Either of them drive a car? Yeah, Sam has a little Nash Rambler, dark green. Once in a while, when we stay over at lunchtime or when we're late getting home, he drives us home or back to school. All right, Doug. Your mother ought to be here by now. If we need your help in getting Sam and Inez, we can count on it, huh? Yeah, I'll help all I can. Okay, son. Let's go. Say, Sergeant. Yeah? I'm sure sorry about the way I acted. Really made a fool of myself. I hope you'll forgive me. That's all right. But you'd think there'd be an easier way, wouldn't you? What's that, son? To grow up. We checked the names Sam and Inez through R&I and, and came up with a Sam and Inez Bailey. Both of them had long records for contributing to the delinquency of minors. Both had served time in the county jail. Douglas Lambert was shown mugshots of the couple and identified them as the owners and operators of Sam's Club. We checked with Captain Stein about picking them up, and it was agreed that the best way would be to catch them in the act of selling liquor and narcotics to juveniles. We talked to the Lambert boy, and he told us that it was the custom of the Baileys to hold a party every Saturday night. He told us that most of the youngsters who frequented the place would be there at that time. He put in a call to the house, but there was no answer. 6.15 p.m., Frank and I drove out to the place. It was a small cottage on the back of the lot. The landlord occupied the house in front. We rang the bell to the manager's house. Yeah? Mr. Halsey? Yeah? Police officer, sir. My name's Friday. This is my partner, Frank Smith. How do you do? I'm Mr. Halsey. Want to come in? Well, it might be better, sir. We'd like to talk to you about the Baileys. Worst tenants I ever had. I knew they'd end up with the police. Why do you say that, sir? Well, I just do, that's all. They got a lease on the house. And if I could figure a way to get them out, I sure would. They're always causing trouble. Mm -hmm. All those kids. Yes, sir. Do you have any idea where they are now? Why, are you going to arrest them? I hope so. Maybe I can break the lease that way. You know where they might be now, sir? No, I don't know. I shoved off this afternoon. They didn't say where they was going. They just left. I wonder if you could let us see their house, sir. Why? Well, we'd like to look it over. Sorry. 
Well, I don't know. What, what do you want for? We think they're selling liquor to miners. Yes, they do a thing like that. The noise they made, the neighbors on both sides have been screaming. Can you let us into their house? You just bet I can. Wait, I'll get the key. Mm -hmm. Here's someplace. But, uh, put in one of those little key rings. You know the kind with a rabbit's foot? Yes, yeah, sir. Sorry to keep your officers waiting. I know I'm always away. If you want something, you, you can always lay your hand right on it. And then when you're looking for it... Oh, here it is. See, that rabbit foot. Yes, sir. Well, you can go out the back door this way. All right, fine. Well, uh, what are you looking for? What do you figure you'll find back there? We're not sure, sir. Frank. Yeah, Joe? You want to stay out here and let us know if they come back? Yeah, I'll wait in front of the house. All right. You know, it's funny about them. What's that, sir? Well, when they first moved in, they said they wanted the locks on the door changed. I told them that it'd be okay, but they'd have to give me a key to the place. They had quite a ruckus about it, but I stood in my ground. They wasn't going to buffalo me, no, sir. Here, I'll, I'll get the lock. All right. Okay. Gee, smells like they haven't had a window open in a year, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Look what they've done to this room. They built a bar and everything. You sure were right about them. I think I can break the lease on this. I'm pretty sure. It says in the contract that they can't do any building without my permission. I certainly didn't give them any okay on this. Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. This is the dining room? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Just pull those doors back. What's that smell, Sergeant? I'm not sure, but I think it might be narcotics. Drugs. I knew it. I knew it all along. Oh, just wait till you get back. I'm really going to tell them. I really am. Rather you didn't do that, sir. What? Rather, you didn't let them know that we were in here, that you know anything about this. Well, why? You're going to arrest them, aren't you? You're not going to let them get away with this. No, sir, but we understand they've got a party planned here tomorrow night. If we wait until then, we can make a charge stick. Oh, you mean they're going to have a drunken brawl? The kids here smoking marijuana, taking heroin and stuff like that? Well, we're not going to let them go that far, sir. We're going to need your cooperation here, Mr. Halsey. Well, what do you want me to do? Well, sir, we want to install listening equipment in here. We'd like to use your house. You mean you're going to bug the place? Well, yes, sir. We like to put in microphones. Well, will it hurt the property? I mean, would you have to put nails in the walls, you know, stuff like that? No, sir, I don't think so. Oh, well, then, then you can do it. Yes, sir, I want to help, Sergeant. That's the trouble with people nowadays. You know, they don't want to help. You just go right ahead and put your, put your microphones in just as long as you don't have to nail anything in the walls. <sighs> all right, sir. If we could go back to your house, I'd like to use the phone if it's all right. You bet. Closing that so they won't know anybody's been here, huh? Yes, sir. Uh-huh. Don't guess if I leave any fingerprints on the door, it'll hurt. No, sir, I don't think it will. No. Can't be too careful, though, you. But then I guess you know all about things like that. Huh? Yes, sir. I'll go around front and get my partner. Yeah, sure thing. You fellas all work in teams like this? Yes, sir, most of the time. Well, I never knew that before. Do you have any idea at all where the Baileys might have gone? Did they give you any indication at all, sir? No. No, I saw them leave this afternoon. Just got in the car and left. Did they take any luggage with them? Suitcases, would you know? Not that I could see, no. Uh-huh. Hi, you find anything? Yeah, the bar's in the living room. Oh, then what the Lambert kid said was true, huh? Yeah, it looks that way. Tell them about the dope in the dining room. How you open the door and smell the fumes. Marijuana? Yeah, it smelled like that. Find any? No, I didn't go over the place too good. I thought if we were going to wire the place, we'd better get on it. Yeah. If we could just use your phone, sir? Oh, yeah, you bet. Come on in. Right there, on the table in the hall. Oh, thank you, sir. Isn't a toll call, is it? No, sir. Well, of course, not to make any difference. Just thought I'd ask. Yes, sir. You figure this will get in one of those detective magazines? Well, I don't know, sir. We've got nothing to do with that. Well, you know, of course, I didn't figure that you did, but if it, if it does, I hope they spell my name right. It's S-E-Y. Uh-huh. Yeah. Some people forget the E, you see. Uh -huh. Spell it with just the Y. 2838, please. Asdale, it's Joe Friday. I want to install a dictograph at 825 North Lucerne. Yeah, 825 North. Mm -hmm. Right away. Yeah, well, you know better than I do. When you see the place, you can figure it. Yeah, the house in the front of the lot. What? Oh, maybe 30, 35 yards? Yeah, okay. Right away. Yeah, good. We'll be in the house in front. Yeah, all right, we'll see you then. All set? Yeah, Asdale's coming right out. Good. You say, Sergeant... Yes, sir? I just uh, happened to think of something. Might not mean anything. What's that, sir? The other day, I think it was Monday. Yes, yes, I'm sure it was Monday because I, I just come back from the laundry. You know, I always pick up my stuff on Monday. Yes, sir. Well, when I came back, I met Mr. Bailey. He was 
put him around with the car. I asked him if he was going to take a trip. He said no, but he said he might get out of town for a little bit. I asked him if I knew anything about the roads. What roads, Mr. Halsey? Down to Mexico. <laughs> listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. And now, a report every smoker should hear. Nose, throat, and accessory organs not adversely affected by smoking Chesterfields. First such report ever published about any cigarette. And it applies only to Chesterfield. A responsible consulting organization has reported the results of a continuing study by a competent medical specialist and his staff on the effects of smoking Chesterfield cigarettes. A group of people from various walks of life was organized to smoke only Chesterfields. For six months, this group of men and women smoked their normal amount of Chesterfields, 10 to 40 a day. 45% of the group have smoked Chesterfields continually from 1 to 30 years, for an average of 10 years each. At the beginning and at the end of the six-month period, each smoker was given a thorough examination, including X-ray pictures, by the medical specialist and his assistants. The examination covered the sinuses as well as the nose, ears, and throat. The medical specialist, after a thorough examination of every member of the group, stated, It is my opinion that the ears, nose, throat, and accessory organs of all participating subjects examined by me were not adversely affected in the six months period by smoking the cigarettes provided. Remember this Chesterfield report. It's the first such report ever published about any cigarette. Nose, throat, and accessory organs not adversely affected by smoking Chesterfields. Buy Chesterfield either way you like them, regular or king size. Chesterfield gives you the best possible smoke. Much milder Chesterfield. <laughs> The men from the crime lab arrived and installed the listening equipment. A stakeout was placed on the house, but the Baileys failed to return that night. At 8.46 a.m. Saturday morning, the men covering the house called to say that the Baileys had just driven in. Frank and I got in touch with Douglas Lambert and his parents. With their permission, we laid out the plan for that night. It was agreed that the boy would arrive at the house at about 8.30 p.m. When the other youngsters had been served drinks, he would give us a signal by starting in to cough. When we came into the house, he would try to secure as many of the drinks as possible for evidence. We told him that there would be officers all around the house and that at no time was he to place himself in jeopardy with Sam, Inez, or any of the other youngsters. 7.30 p.m., Frank and I took up our positions in the back bedroom of the owner's house, turned on the dictograph, and waited. The Baileys were discussing the party. Sam was talking about how he watered the whiskey. At 8.27 p.m., four youngsters arrived. They rang the doorbell, and when Sam opened the door, they displayed the required bill. He nodded and ushered them into the living room. They did a good job in there, didn't they? Yeah, they did. Really hear it. Mm-hmm. Lambert boys should be here pretty quick. Yeah. Doesn't sound like they're starting anything in there yet, does it? No. How long do you figure we wait before we go in? As soon as he starts to cough. You check with the other men? Yeah, Turner and Brown are covering the back of the place. Oh. Lindsay and Carter and a couple of police women are parked down the street. You can see the car down there. Yeah. Wait a minute. Huh? Looks like the Lambert kid now coming up the walk. Yeah, it is. I sure hope everything goes all right. All right, let's turn it up a little more, huh? Is that better? Yeah. I'll get it, honey. Change that record, will you? I heard it four times. Yeah. Oh, hi, Doug. Come on in. Thanks, huh? Wasn't sure you'd be here tonight. What made you figure that? You know, I wouldn't miss one of these. I just figured you might have gotten a little bit of trouble with everything. No, it's all right now. Yeah, well, take it easy tonight, huh? Sure, Sam. Who is it, honey? Doug Lambert. Hi, Doug. You having any trouble with that McLean kid? No, I was telling Sam the cops talked to me for a while. They didn't have anything on me, so they had to let me go. You didn't tell him anything about this place, did you? Well, of course not. You know I wouldn't do that. He wouldn't, Diane. I told you Doug's all right. We can trust him. Ah, yeah, things worry me. The cops get wise to this place, and we really got problems. Oh, honey, I tell you, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Come on, let's get on with the sociable. What do you have, Doug? Whiskey, I guess. Good deal. Hey, you want a stick? Got some fresh stuff in real good. Yeah, sure. That's my boy. You know, Doug, I like you. You're a good kid. Some of the other guys come in here. I guess Inez is right about them. They're jerks, but well, I feel I can trust you. Oh, excuse me. Well, you've got to fix the other kids up. Okay, with the feet. Come on, kid. Got something in your throat? I don't know. I just started the come call. Come on, Mike.
door's locked. Let's hit it. What's going on? Who are you guys? Police officers. You're under arrest. What for? What are you trying to pull? Pull it, everybody. Right where you are. Did you hear it all, Sergeant? Yeah, Doug, we did. Hear what? You in on this, Doug? I told you not to trust any of them. I told you, but you wouldn't listen. You want to kill the phonograph, Frank? I got Where'd it. you get the marijuana, Doug? Out of that drawer. There in back of the bar. Yeah. There's nothing there. Right here, Doug? It was way in the back. Shut up, you. Al, what about these, Sam? I don't know what you're talking about. I never saw those before. All right, mister, let's go. I'll get Turner and Brown. They can take care of the kid. Right. You and your ideas. I told you we shouldn't have come back. I told you. Oh, knock it off. Shut your mouth, will you? I told you last night we should have kept driving, but oh, no, you figure we got a sweet racket here. You don't want to change it. It's good, you said. Yeah? How does it look now? Look, I'm telling you, take it easy. All right, let's go, huh? It's the way it is, Sergeant. Try to make a living for a woman, make things nice. The first time something goes wrong, she starts to squawk. Never failed. You're riding high, everything's fine. Him and his living, always trying to build something up, always trying to figure out a way to beat the game. One big deal, one big thing to set him up for good. Yeah, well, I think he made it this time. Let's go. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On January 14th, trial was held in Department 89, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you. Friends, as you know, on Dragnet, we've always tried to emphasize the importance of facts. And when we talk to you about Chesterfield, we give you the facts. You heard the report George Fenneman read earlier. Nose, throat, and accessory organs not adversely affected by smoking Chesterfields. That's the first such report ever published about any cigarette. Remember that report and make Chesterfield your cigarette. Get them, regular or king size. Chesterfield, the best possible smoke, much milder. <laughs> Samuel G. Bailey and Inez R. Bailey were filed on under the Health and Safety Code, Section 11,500, Possession and Sale of Narcotics, and found guilty on one count. They were found guilty on two counts of contributing to the delinquency of a minor. Violation of Section 11,500 of the Health and Safety Code is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not more than five years or imprisonment in the county jail. Contributing to the delinquency of a minor is punishable by imprisonment in the county jail for a period of not more than one year. The boy, Douglas Lambert, was made a ward of the juvenile court. Ladies and gentlemen, where the community chest is at work, red feather services like youth programs and clinics, hospitals, and the USO give direct help to two families out of five every year. And indirectly, everybody benefits. Because community chest services make America's cities and towns healthier, happier places to live. So give generously to your community chest. Pledge enough for all the community campaigns that are united under the Red Feather banner. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the Office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Sam Edwards, Vic Rodman. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Tomorrow, sound off for Chesterfields. Either way you like them, regular or king size. Chesterfield gives you the best possible smoke. Much milder Chesterfield. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Chesterfield.